All right, we good? All right. Well, I'll assume this, that this works. I'll click it in a minute when we go to the next slide. So today, I am going to be your guide through something. It's not something that I'm here to teach you, really. It's more just let's do it together. Let's take this time. Let's go through studying the Bible, how to study the Bible from David Platt. He's somebody I respect a lot. Uh, I like the way he teaches, uh, the way that he doesn't pull any punches. He's uh, the guy that wrote Radical. Some of you may have heard of uh, the book Radical. I was reading this week about radical and people questioning, does he live radically? Does he give radically and all that? And uh, of course, I was interested. I thought, yeah, does he? I mean, surely I want, that's a great anecdote to start this with is the guy that we're doing, or that we're talking through this, you know, he lives like this and he gives so much because he writes all these books. So he really could be pretty wealthy, but I figured he gives it away like Francis Chan. So I was trying to find that so I could tell all of you, look at this amazing example. All I found was, Somebody saying, what do you care? What does it matter if he does or he doesn't? Uh, it's like when Jesus rebuked Peter and was kind of like, hey, you, you worry about your own self. Uh, don't worry about other people, what they're doing. So we won't worry about David and what he does or doesn't do. We'll try to just focus on us and how we study the Bible. But uh, we'll, we'll go through this uh, today. I, I thought about preaching on Father's Day because it's Father's Day to Americans at least. So happy Father's Day. Uh, it's my wife's birthday. I could have preached about her. She would have been incredibly embarrassed. <laughs> exactly. Uh, might have been in trouble. I don't know. I might have gotten a lot of points though too. So you never know. I at least cooked breakfast this morning. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to be on the right track uh, there as much as any husband can do. All right. So jumping into this. So how do we study the Bible? He has several ways that he suggests we should study the Bible. Uh, that's a funny thing up there on the top. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, wow. This is not good. This is not good at all. So, the, yeah, can't y'all read that? You know, that's how you study the Bible. Right there. We're going to need some divine intervention. Thankfully, I have it on my phone, too. So we'll click over here and I'll just go off my phone. Always have a backup plan. So the first way we study is prayerfully. So we never study the Bible alone. His point is Jesus is always there with you. You're never sitting there with the Bible, just you and the Bible. You know, Jesus is always with you. Uh, I even looked up some good pictures. I didn't take the time to put them in here. But for me, I like a mental image. And so I found some great pictures of somebody sitting there studying their Bible and Jesus sitting beside them. And uh, so uh, that's, that's one way he suggests that you're doing that is, is prayerfully, humbly is the next way. So do you really want to know him or are we just trying to get into the Bible for us to check it off? You know, we, we must humble ourselves and really ask to know him. Hey, there we go. What do you know? We don't pay those guys enough in the back. I'll tell you, tell you that much right now. I'll preach on that another Sunday, giving them a raise. But uh, So we also study the Bible carefully. We want to understand the text rightly. Uh, so we don't read into it. Uh, it was kind of like last time I preached, I talked about uh, we're not adding to it, we're not taking away, we're not using our Western or Eastern or whatever our cultural eyes are reading into that. He had two uh, funny examples. One of them was in Leviticus. He said, it says that, you know, we shouldn't wear a garment with two different fabrics. And so he said, so does that mean we all need to be 100% cotton? <laughs> Uh, do we take that literally and or do we carefully read it and know that that's not what he meant today is that we have to only wear one kind of fabric on our whole body. The other one was Matthew 14 where he's talking about Peter walking on the water. He said if you take that literally and you think well that's what I'm supposed to do then you might do some really crazy things at the at the Wiesner's pool this summer uh, when you go over there you feel like you need to to do what Peter did. So we're careful as we read it. We're joyful. Read it joyfully. Uh, it involves the thrill of personal discovery. So you see things that you've never seen before. Uh, a lot of times uh, we were watching a, a movie for the second time and I was commenting to Emily last night of how, oh man, I noticed this the second time. And so in the Bible, it's even more that way. You start to see new words pop out at you. And um, I've, I see stories sometimes that I think, I've been a Christian my whole life. And I guess I knew that, but I didn't really realize that that's what that said. So it can be very exciting, personally. And then we study the Bible simply. You, the Bible, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. 
Uh, it doesn't have to feel like you're on the mountaintop moment. So even though there's thrill of personal discovery, it's also a simple experience where we just meet with the Holy Spirit. And if you can read, you can do it. So it doesn't take any special skills to do it. We also study the Bible confidently. So the Holy Spirit is in you, in you to enable you to do this. So we have the same power that we see in the Bible over and over again. You know, Jesus says that same power is in you. Uh, you will do even greater things. Um, we study the Bible consistently. So we need to be equipped to study every text of every book. So a lot of times we go to the same ones. Oh man, I'm a, I'm a John kind of guy. You know, obviously I like John a lot. But uh, John, the book of the Bible, John, a lot of people like that. It's, it's a great book. And so you might read John over and over. Emily's uncle reads Matthew, or he did, for five straight years. He read Matthew. That was it. Woke up every morning, read through, you know, however far he got. When he finished, he started over. And he, just, he did that for five straight years. And he said it was an amazing experience. He learned so much. And that's not bad. But David is suggesting we need to be consistent. We need to read through the Bible. There's, there's many things in the other parts that may be left uh, un, unseen. Also study the Bible diligently. Learning to study the Bible will not happen overnight. So he, he's very careful uh, when he talks about this to not say that it's a hard thing. It's not something you need to be scared of and think, well, not, a, not anybody can do it. it. It takes certain skills and I'm just not good at it. And we talk about that more in a minute. But it does take consistency and you do have to be diligent in doing it. And then study the Bible intentionally. He suggests always have a notebook, pen and pencil in hand. You know, God's going to reveal things to you. He's going to say things to you. Uh, things are going to occur to you. Oh, man, that's amazing. Uh, it's great if you can write that down. As most of us are getting older, even though some of us are not that old. My wife, very young, uh, very beautiful. But uh, we are starting to not remember every single thing. For many of us, we live all over the world. We do crazy things. We go on trips. And we got a lot of things going into our, our minds. So... It's hard to remember things that God is revealing to us. He talks about in his uh, house, they lost their house in Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and he said the thing that hurt him the most, that he was most sad about, was all of his journals. He lost years and years of journals where he had written, and it was his spiritual journey. And he, he tried to save them. He, he dried them out, and he said they got very moldy, and finally he realized it just wasn't going to happen. So he threw them away. But uh, yeah, keep, keep a notebook, pen and pencil. So you can see what God has done. I, I, I like that example because you can go back. And I have a good friend in the U.S. that does that at the first of every year. Uh, he writes down his goals for the year. And then at the end of the year, he's able, it's kind of like Ade. Uh, you can go back and say, wow, God, God really showed up on these things you know, more than I even realized. Uh, and then the last one is study the Bible personally. You'll fall in love with the author of the book. You'll find true life under the authority of the book. So this is a very personal thing. So he talks about dangerous approaches to Bible study. So there's things that we do, some of us, um, certain ones we're, we're more uh, prone to do the emotional approach. You know, what feels right to me? I'm studying the Bible and, you know, well, that, that feels like what he's, what he's saying there. Another one, the spiritual, might not sound bad, but what deep hidden meaning is there for you? If you study it, if you pick apart a text enough, then you'll start to build things into it, kind of like my last sermon, that aren't actually there. You, you might put things into there that aren't there. So you don't want to try to pick it apart so much that you make it something that it's not. Other one was pragmatic. What works best for me? Yeah, that verse works well for me in my life, and that one doesn't work as well, so I'm more of a, a this kind of guy than a that kind of guy. You're, you're making it you know, personal. And then the last one is superficial. What does this passage mean to me? Which is the, the epitome of all of this. It's, it's one of the things he talks about in other studies is when we get into a Bible study and often the leader uh, will go around and we'll read a verse and say, what does that mean to you? And he says, well, who cares what it means to you? It doesn't, doesn't matter what it means to you. The question is, what does it mean? Uh, what, what, did, what does God mean by this? Not... What does it mean to you? And he, he's not being overly critical. I, I've heard him preach on this, and he's just saying we have to be careful. These are dangerous approaches. 
to how we study the Bible. So he wants to suggest a dependable approach to Bible study. I like this for our group a lot because we live overseas. So he talks about going on a mission trip, or for us, we live on a mission trip, uh, many of us. So he talks about when you go on a mission trip or when we live in a foreign culture like we do, we observe the person's home. We get, you pretend you're going into somebody's home, first time, new culture maybe. What do you see there? Uh, you're being very observant. You try to understand their home. What does it mean? You know, what's in their home? What does that mean? Why do they have it there? And then you try to bring that back home with you. How does that relate to you in your home? And then applying it. How do you apply that? In your home so what do we do with what we what we learn he gave some some funny examples some of you may have been to Africa or you may be from Africa so you know the hand-holding is, is a thing uh, for an American especially a Texan that's a new thing when we moved to Nigeria and there were men holding hands I thought oh boy that's crazy and then you realize it's the MD of the company it's uh, the vice presidents you know they're walking around holding hands you think Man, this is a crazy place but it just it's different. It means something totally different. Greeting with a kiss means something totally different in one culture. So he's saying before we try to project onto the Bible what we're doing, let's think about it more like a mission trip. When you're going on a mission trip, you're very open-minded. Oh, this is going to be interesting. What am I going to see here? What do they do here? Why do they do that? Uh, and so to put that into the Word, he says, let's take a trip into the Word. You know, so in the same way you observe the person's home, you're Observing the setting uh, or the person's home if the if the text is written in a person's home So what do I see in the word there? You know you're first observing from the outside as a guest. So this involves exploration. You're exploring the setting And then discover what the text is saying. This is a question of, of context uh, He says we often just grab a verse and we read it and we say oh, that's very interesting It is important to see what was happening around that time get some context and then second is to understand the setting in the same way you try to understand their home not just observe well they have you know paintings hanging on the wall or you know we watched a movie this weekend that was talking about Spanish culture and we're trying to explain to Michael the uh, you would get a kick out of this the ofrenda and we were talking about all these Spanish words and uh, you know putting the ancestors pictures up on the up on the mantle and you know every year uh, what, what it dia De muerte. Yes, that's what it is. Thankfully, I have a wife that speaks Spanish. I do not. Uh, you know, Day of the Dead and stuff. And so we were explaining to Michael, and he's, oh, okay, so do they really come back? Do the ancestors come back? And, um, so you have to ask more questions than just see what it is to understand why did they do what they do? What's the culture? We want to know what it means. And so that involves interpreting it. Uh, and then we try to bring that back home. How does that relate to us, our culture, our home? Uh, and that involves not exploration or interpretation, but the implications. What implications does this have for me? We want to see how that text travels uh, to another culture, to our culture, to where I'm sitting here in South Korea reading this text that was written 2,000 years ago. Um, how does that travel then here? And so that's a, a question of how do I connect then with that? And then how do I apply it? Because at the end of the day, that's what matters, is how are we applying Scripture uh, more than anything. So what do I do? And that involves application. How does that transform my life? Uh, I've got a cousin in the U.S. who had a crazy life, uh, sex, drug, and rock and roll, you know, basically, uh, for many years, and then just totally swung all the way to Jesus. Uh, his name is Caleb, actually. We named our son after him. Uh, he's an amazing man now. Uh, he was always one of my best friends, but not that I was into those things. Uh, let's just, <laughs> this is being recorded. Uh, but he talks about how oftentimes you'll see a Christian, but he uses the words, it doesn't inform their life. You know, it doesn't change what they do. He, and so that's disappointing. We want to bring that into application so that it informs our life and we apply it and it transforms our life. So that one's not a question of connection, but a question of conduct. So then he suggests there's two revolutionary disciplines for reading the Bible, and that is learning to listen and learning to look. So those are the two things we'll go through. We'll look at learning to listen and learning to look. First one, learning to listen. So we learn to listen thoughtfully. Bible study is not a mindless activity. So 
he talks about his, his wife, and it reminded me of Emily. There was a time when we were dating where we were writing notes. It's really me, me writing her notes, but uh, you, you, wrote, you wrote me some notes then later and put them on my windshield and stuff. But uh, in the beginning, I was stalking her. Um, that's a story for another time. But uh, David Platt, his very wholesome uh, preacher story, uh, was that when his wife would write him notes, that was his first girlfriend ever, and first girl to ever write him notes. And so he was inexperienced in that, receiving a note. And so he receives this note <laughs> from this woman there in college. And she's saying, uh, dear David. And he's, he said, man, I'm breaking that down. You know, dear David. D does she say dear to everybody or, or am I dear David? Would uh, somebody else just be David? Uh, okay, you know, I'm, I enjoyed meeting you. She enjoyed meeting me. Did she, did she really enjoy it or did she enjoy everything? You know, I, I'm praying for you. Does she pray for everybody or is it, is it special? Is she praying for me over and above? Is she praying for me like future husband? Uh, does she think that's who I am? He said, boy, I was just into every word trying to read into it. What does she really mean here? So he suggests that's why we should read the Bible excited what is God telling me right here? Oh my goodness, he's saying this word and this word and I think that's what he's saying and it's, it's an exciting, uh, exciting activity. So we're learning to listen to God. The next one is learning to listen thoroughly. So if we want to understand the Bible, we've got to bombard it with questions. The Bible can handle your questions. God can handle you yelling at Him. That, he, that, he's not worried about you. Not that I'm suggesting you yell at Him in Bible study, but He made you. He loves you. He's okay with you questioning. Wait a minute. That doesn't make sense, God. That... You know, why? Uh, or I'm frustrated or I just want to know you or reveal yourself to me. You can be real uh, with him. So the questions he proposes here is who? So we're asking these questions of who wrote it when we're picking out a text, who originally read it. So we're trying to put ourselves in that home uh, or in that setting. Who are the main characters? What is happening in the text? What is wrong with this picture? Uh, so sometimes there is something that that Jesus is trying to reveal to us in a parable or something, and we're seeing that, yeah, he's saying that that's not the way it should be. What is the author saying? Uh, where is the writer? Some of these are hard. They're hard for me, I have to admit. It's, this is not something I, I do, and that's why I wanted to be very clear. This is not something I'm saying, this is what I do, and you can study in my school of theology and you know, come every, every week and I'll teach you these things. It's not. It's something that I'm very attracted to, and I, I too, like you, want to, to do this, to learn this. So uh, I, I'm with you in this, but it's hard for me sometimes to get the context, to know when was it written, who wrote it, why did they write it, uh, what's interesting about this in that culture at that time so that's where I think he's saying it comes it comes over time you, you will do this deeper and deeper as you go and you'll learn new parts of this you may not have the answers to every one of these questions every time you're reading a text so where are the original readers where is the text taking place uh, when was it written sometimes that is in our Bible especially nowadays we can see you know, this was written in such and such a time, uh, or they at least think they know. When did the events take place? Why is the author writing this? Why is this included in Scripture? So that's, that's a big one to me is if God put it in there, there's a reason. It's, it's not a haphazard, you know, well, we got 500 good pages. It'd be cool if this was a 600-page book. Let's throw another 100 in there. Yeah, it was picked out. The people that wrote it, this was uh, a very intentional book coming together uh, and there's interesting studies uh, I've done we did one in Olson John uh, and I did one on the origins of the Bible how it came to be and how certain things didn't make it in or why they didn't make it in and just the struggle the the martyrdom that was uh, experienced during that time people that gave their whole lives and David talks about it in some of his follow-ups to this of how we got the Bible uh, that's very interesting so and then why did the events happen the way that they did? And why did the author say what he said? So again, a lot of intentionality in that. The next one is learning to listen repeatedly. So reading the text over and over and over, you get the point. <laughs> uh, we did this in a small church, but 200 people maybe. That's a small church in America. Uh, but we did this uh, exercise with our elder team, leadership team there in that small church uh, with, I think it was Luke 10, I wanna say, many, many years ago, like 15 years ago when we were first dating uh, or first married. 
And it was amazing when we read one text, it was one section, not, a, not even a chapter, but one section of Scripture over and over and over again. New things did come to life. We started asking questions about it. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. Uh, it's, it's nearly like God reveals more, more to you. The more time you dedicate to Him, the more He's like, oh, okay, well, hey, well, <laughs> since you've got time, let me show you something else really cool. Uh, since you're not in a hurry and not checking this off your list. The next one was learning to listen patiently. So that good segue to that. Be patient with the text and be patient with yourself. So that one works well with repeating it, reading it repeatedly uh, and being patient with what the text is saying. Are you understanding it? Praying that you will understand it and then being patient yeah, with yourself as well. The next one, learning to listen imaginatively. Seeing the sights, the smells, the experience, the emotions, that works well with his, his mission trip example or our expat life we have had i feel like we've hit the jackpot in the life we've gotten to live here seeing korea seeing other countries many of us have lived in other countries we we get things on another level that many of our family and friends don't get you know something like this seeing the sights the smells experience the emotions we've gotten to see the other side uh, of that and see what amazing smells there are out there. Uh, I remember growing up and thinking, I never wanted to move to Asia because, I mean, I like Chinese food okay, but it's not amazing. Uh, and yeah, now it's hilarious. You think, wow, what a narrow-minded Texan. Uh, there's a lot of us out there, by the way. Uh, we're trying to repent uh, or trying to start a movement in that. But yeah, Brad and I are, are heading that movement up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's American Chinese food. I actually liked it all right, but Korean food is much better. That's what. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, he was from San Antonio. Probably ate a lot of good Mexican food. The next one, learning to listen meditatively, taking the time to reflect. Uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer said, Just as you do not analyze the words of someone you love, but accept them as they are said to you, accept the word of Scripture and ponder it in your heart as Mary did. That is all, that is meditation. So this is a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus, with God. We, we can take those words and just accept them the same way if your wife said something, you wouldn't say, well, what is, I don't know. I don't know if I understand what you're saying. If you do understand it, then say, wow, this is great. You know, accept it in. Don't make it harder than it is. Meditate in that, love God in that, build that relationship with Him by spending that, that time. Three good verses uh, for this. Joshua 1, eight. Do not let this book of law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And then the last one, Psalm 119, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. And then the last one on learning to listen is purposefully. So we want our lives transformed by the heart of God through his word. Uh, we want to go take this and apply it. We want there to be purpose in it. We're listening with what are you trying to tell me so that I can go do blank? You know, what, this is not a, a meeting without purpose. This is a meeting with great purpose. So learning to, to look is what that, that should say. Uh, I don't know how that got learning to listen. Um, it's because I'm unprofessional. Uh, and uh, the art of, of Bible reading is seeing. This is a, a good example that he did. So we, we can do this with you too. We can see if you did better than his audience. He had several hundred people in this audience that he was preaching this to, and uh, they didn't get it right. So let's see if you're smarter than them. So how many squares are there below? You, 16, 24. 30. Look at John. Well done, John. Nobody got 30 in the original audience, and so he had to say, no, it's not 16, no, it's not 24, no, it's not 27. Uh, and he said, all right, I'll tell you after the break, let's just move on. And then he said, ah, oh, forget it. I, you, none of you are going to focus until I tell you. So it's, it's 30, it's 30. Just, okay, go back to 
And then he was joking, saying, are you still trying to count it? You know, okay, look, it's, uh, so there are 30. Trust John, I'm not surprised. Well done, John, you get the prize. <laughs> so learning to look, learning to look. So we look for what the word emphasizes. So verbs, uh, how does the author depict the action of the text? You know, words, very powerful. We were talking to Michael about this yesterday. He kind of got his feelings hurt about something that was said. And we were trying to say, we understand that. Words are very important to you. Uh, we are now seeing that more and more as he gets older. You know, what is said really matters to him. Not as much what you meant by it, but, you know, you said this. And so in the same way, God is purposeful in the words he uses, the verbs. Is the verb past, present, uh, or future? What's he trying to say to us? Uh, Ephesians 1.11, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So, many, many good verbs in there. We were chosen. We have been predestined. Uh, He's working out everything. So, again, you could take that verse and, and we could probably preach on, on that verse alone. But uh, is the verb imperative? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Most of us probably would be pulled to the go. Therefore, go. We've all gone. We're living over here. And we, but he makes the point that, that that's not... Go is not the one. Is not the verb we're talking about here. It's make disciples. That's... That's the imperative. That's the important part of this. It's not the going, but it's the making disciples uh, that's important. It's the one command, he, he says, that Jesus gave us, the, very, the most clear command He gave us, and it's probably the one we don't do. Uh, we, we can probably do everything else better, but the making disciples is an area that, that we need to do better to really be intentional on in that. Is the verb active or passive? Uh, so the... Genesis 12, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. He makes the point that there's active and passive there and the active being what he's doing with Abraham or Abram. Uh, and the passive being all of us, you know, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Uh, instead, be filled with the Spirit. And then Colossians 3, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The next thing we're looking for what the word emphasizes is space. Uh, this is a, somewhat of an easy one. Any of us can, can see, wow, there's a lot of text. A lot of the Bible devoted to that topic must be important is the point he's making. That do put value in the amount of space that's dedicated to something. So, is the author devoting concentrated attention to a certain theme, character, event? Uh, Genesis 1 to 11 spends a lot of time talking about the fall of man, the history, Cain and Abel. Uh, 12 through 50, he, he's given us the, the story of how we became who we are. He, he's, he's setting that foundation for, for man uh, there in a, in a big way. Matthew, uh, he says that there's 1,062 verses and at least 342 of them, so a third of the book, give us teachings from, from Jesus. So a big part of that book is dedicated to those teachings of Jesus. Must be really important. And then in Ephesians, the explanation of salvation, he's dedicating three chapters, and then the application of salvation, the same amount. So he's really trying to make the point of application. And then we're looking for what the word emphasizes in a purpose statement. So does the author describe why he says something or why something happens? Uh, often he will do that. We're looking for words like uh, that, in order that, so that, to, or for, uh, we're getting the purpose of, of what's happening. You can see that in, in these verses, uh, Deuteronomy 4. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it, 
Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Psalm 119, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. John 3.16, one of the most well-known verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 15, You did not choose Me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in My name. And the last one, John 20, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the God, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. So a lot of purpose in there. And then we're looking for what the word emphasizes in order. Order is important. Uh, he gives this example uh, of, he lists the disciples in these sections in the same order. You, you can see certain people are always listed in the same spot. Uh, and so is the author giving strategic importance to something by putting it in a certain order? Uh, is he trying to tell us, you know, Simon Peter, always at the top of the list? Uh, so take note of that. And then the last thing is we're looking for what the word emphasizes, exaggeration. So is the author exaggerating something for intentional effect or emphasis? Uh, also, is he saying it, but and it's exaggeration, it's not literal. So. <coughs> Psalm 119 again, My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. Uh, 2 Corinthians, I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. Did Paul really rob other churches? You know, David says if he did, then that just really, I could preach about that for days. Uh, that, that's uh, that's going to change things if he was actually out there robbing other churches. Uh, so, no, it's an exaggeration. He's trying to make a point in that. And so we're looking for that. And then Jesus, you blind guides in Matthew 23, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. If they were doing that, then I mean, we watched The Greatest Showman the other day about P.T. Barnum and the circus. Great movie, by the way. Uh, yeah, I mean, they had a future in the circus if they were straining out gnats and swallowing camels. Um, so, no, that Jesus was using the exaggeration. He was trying to make a point here. Um, so, we, ha we have to grasp that and see that must have been important. He must have been exaggerating that to really say, hey, listen up here. So, few things to maybe enrich your Bible study. Uh, I think it, it definitely will mine. Uh, there's a handout guide that you can get that David preaches on this in like four different sections over six hours. So I decided to break this down into a 30 minute section for you instead of a six hour. We could do that next time if you want to, but uh, it will be very, very uh, long if we have to do that. Uh, I need a lot of preparation and a pay raise probably uh, to do that. But it is very helpful, very good. I encourage you to go look for it. It's David Platt, How to Study the Bible, Secret Church. And very encouraging. And so I hope it is something that you can apply uh, in your Bible study. And I will uh, pray now and we can move on. God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that it is Father's Day. We thank you for all of us that uh, we're, we're blessed to have a, a father that showed us what you are like, uh, some way that we could follow. Uh, we thank you for those of us that didn't have that Father, but that have you and that you came in and rescued, that you loved us and that you showed us what a, a true Father really is. And uh, we pray for all of the fathers that are out here, that they would embrace you, that they would get their direction from you every morning, that they would study their Bibles and seek you so that they would be able to impart to their children uh, those same lessons and that they would be able to model for their kids what a good, good father is, uh, just like you. We thank you uh, for this time that we've been able to spend looking at, at ways we can study your word. Uh, we pray that you would help us remember uh, these things, that we would spend the time with you, that we would learn to listen to you, and we would learn to look for what you're trying to say to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.